challenge of the Ill illegal Israeli blockade of Gaza. And I know many of you all have been uh, very supportive of the actions that have been taken over the last really eight years where various groups have tried to sail boats to Gaza to bring international attention to the fact that this little tiny area of Ga a place called Gaza, uh, only 25 miles long and five miles wide, which really is a focal point of, of uh, international attention at times because of the uh, Israeli attacks on Gaza, attacks that the Israeli government says, well, we have to defend ourselves from rockets that are fired from Gaza. And I don't condone the rockets at all. Uh, but when you have a population now that is over 2 million, 2 million people living in that little area of Gaza, that area that, I mean, all of Israel has 8.5 million. And yet in this tiny little area called Gaza Strip, there are 2 million people that are living there. And a, a place where there is a natural harbor in Gaza City that could be used for the import of, of food and materials uh, and for export of things that are still made despite four major attacks by the Israelis over the last seven years in 2009, 2012, 2013, and 2014. Major attacks by the Israeli military that have destroyed a heck of a lot of, um, of housing there uh, and commercial business there and agricultural lands there. But still they do have things they'd like to export but they can't because all their sides are controlled. Three sides controlled by Israel, the Mediterranean side. Oh yeah, I have a pointer. Uh -huh. Let's see if I can use that. The Mediterranean side uh, by the Israeli naval blockade that goes out 20 miles. Actually it goes as far as they want because they captured us 34 miles out. And they've captured other boats of ours way, way up, 70 miles out. And then the northern border uh, uh, on the Israeli southern border, and then all of this area, Israel, and then down here, the border that's on, on Egypt. And Egypt with the al-Sisi regime that overthrew the Morsi government, the Muslim Brotherhood government elected by uh, the people in, in Egypt in 2000, what was it, 12? and then overthrown by the military, and al-Sisi as the main general, who then took over in the military coup, uh, have blocked that, uh, that uh, southern border. So essentially, Gaza remains a, an open-air prison where people cannot move uh, at their own will. They are beholding to someone to ever get out of there. Students that want to get scholarships are beholding to, uh, primarily to Israel to finally let them out. Food comes in only through Israel. Materials for, for building uh, come only through Israel at whatever pace and volume that the Israelis decide. Payments from the uh, Palestinian Authority to government workers in Gaza go through Israel. So everything, electricity, water, everything goes through Israel, which tightens the neck around uh, Gaza uh, all the time. Uh, this is the seventh year, eighth year actually, that uh, international boats have challenged the Israeli blockade of Gaza. The first one was through the Free Gaza Movement in 2008, where four little boats actually got into uh, the Gaza City Harbor. The first time in over 40 years, really, that there had been any, any boats going in. And over the next years, in 2009 and 10, you remember 2010, when six boats tried to go into Gaza, one of them being the Marvi Marmara, a Turkish ship that had over 600 people in it. And that ship was attacked by the Israeli Defense Forces uh, and nine people were executed and executed. I mean, close range, purposeful, I'm killing that person, that person, and that person. 50 others were wounded. Another person has died from his wounds. So essentially 10 people died in 2012 uh, or 2011, we had a 10, uh, 10 ship uh, flotilla. And many of you contributed to the US boat to Gaza, the fundraisers that we had all over the country for the US boat to Gaza that we called the audacity of hope. The audacity of hope. Using President Obama's own words when he in June of 2009 was so 
we thought it was so optimistic that here we finally had a president that was talking about the need to balance out the policies that we have on Israel and Palestine. But as his administration went on, it turned out there was no balance at all. So we used his words even two years after he said them uh, in 2011 for the U.S. boat to Gaza, where the Israeli government uh, had a different tactic. It's, it was to pay off the Greek government not to let our ships leave Greece. And that's what happened. The Greeks stopped us by using administrative procedures uh, to, uh, to not let the boats go. Well, you don't say that to all the activists and they agree. And so our U.S. boat to Gaza, the Audacity of Hope, broke free one afternoon and got as far as five miles offshore before the Greek commando stopped us and brought us back into port. In 2012, we had an, uh, a boat called the Estelle from Sweden that attempted to break the naval blockade. And in 2015, we had six boats that left Crete to attempt to break the blockade. One of them, the Marianne, went all the way down to the, next to the coast before it was captured. The others we brought back, um, not sacrificing all of the ships then. So in 2016, what do we do? That was the question for the international coalition. What do we do? How do we, how do we keep people interested in this? Uh, the people in Gaza are very interested in it because they are the ones that receive a little bit of international attention when an international boat tries to break that blockade. And that's the purpose, the mission of our flotillas is to get international attention to the fact that the Israeli government still has this blockade on Gaza, that no commercial traffic can come in, and indeed that the Israeli military is uh, keeping fishermen, Palestinian fishermen, close into the shoreline, that they cannot go out into the Mediterranean really to fish, that they have to stay within two miles of the coast of, of Gaza. Um, two miles where there is polluted water because the sewage system of Gaza, which gets bombed on the very first day that the Israelis attack, whenever it is, it's that sewage system that gets bombed and then raw sewage goes right into the Mediterranean. And that's where these, these fishermen are, are um, that's where they have to fish. The Israeli military goes after them with boats. They fire on boats, they kill fishermen, they sink boats. So this blockade, this, um, uh, security zone is, is a very uh, visible zone in a way, a visible zone for oppression and death. So this time, how are we going to get more people to be involved in this again, again, every year we keep fundraising and a lot of people say, you know, we've done that. We've been sending boats for so long. Can't you think of something else? And aren't there more important ways to uh, show your concern for the Palestinians in both Gaza and the West Bank. And indeed, the, there are some more projects like the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Program, which is really caught on all around the world. And we totally support that. And in fact, it is so, so important. And it is, so, it is having such an effect that even uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, in his speech to the APAC, uh, American, Inter American Israeli Public Affairs Committee in Washington two years ago, 15 times quoted, I mean, said, BDS is a strategic threat to the state of Israel. So it's having its effect. And we totally support it and we want you all to support it. But there are other people who say, we want to go after that blockade of Gaza too. And so this time we came upon the idea of let's send a women's boat to Gaza to see if maybe that would energize the community a little more, that a boat of women, captain and crewed by women and women passengers on it, would that, would that somehow get the attention of the international media, which is really the focus of what we're doing? And indeed it did, indeed. Maybe not in the United States. I mean, did you all read much about it? A little bit, a little bit. But actually, not much in the, in the US media. But around the world, there was a lot of interest in it. There was a lot of interest in the, in the Middle East. There was a lot of interest in Europe. But it's breaking into our own uh, 
our own media market here in the United States that is a difficult one. Well, we had a, a real journey on this one. It, we didn't go from just the little island, oops, the little island of Crete, where normally we take off and go two and a half days here. Oh no, mm -hmm. we wanted to get our money's worth out of this one. So we started up here in Barcelona, Spain. That's actually where we bought the boats. We had started out with two boats. We wanted to have two for safety reasons. We bought two boats in, in uh, Barcelona and then we took, I'll go into this a little more detail, but one of the boats kind of like, it didn't blow up, but the engine just stopped working the moment we left Barcelona Harbor, the moment. So only one boat made the trip to uh, Ajaccio, Corsica, France, and that same boat went on down to Messina, Sicily, Italy, and the same boat went on 1,000 miles, nine days, all the way to 34 miles off Gaza. So, uh, here again another little map, and you can see the size difference between Gaza, the rest of Israel, and even the West Bank. Gaza is such a small little place, small place, and yet is the focal point of so much destruction by the Israeli military. These are the two boats that we purchased. Uh, one uh, on the left is called the uh, Zaituna Olivia, or Zaituna in Arabic, it means olive, in honor of one of the um, great products, great, um, um, I mean, it's famous. The, the Middle East is famous for its olives. And so we named one for the olive and for its beautiful olive trees, many of which are being uprooted in the West Bank by the Israeli military as they go in uh, with these illegal settlements. And the one on the right, uh, the, the Amal. Where is that? There it is. The Amal. Does anybody know what that means, Amal? Hope. It means hope. So that was, uh, those are the two boats. Uh, we had eight national campaigns and international campaigns. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Sweden, Norway, Canada, the United States, and Malaysia uh, all had national campaigns to raise money to buy these boats. And then the international campaign in the siege, which is located in the UK and does a lot of work in the Middle East, where the the primary groups a part of this. And here are some of the, uh, the materials that various groups were using to let people know in their own countries that we were, we were going to have a uh, women's boat to Gaza. This is the first fundraiser we had in, in the United States, which was in New York City. And this is the international campaigns. And how do you like the logo? This one right here? But, um, yeah, it was, we, we had over 30 submissions in our logo contest from all over the world. And this was submitted by a young man from the West Bank. And it's just a beautiful one, isn't it? Just the, uh, uh, we do have t-shirt shirts. I don't have them here, but I'll, I'll tell you where. If you would like to have a t-shirt, we can make sure you get one. <laughs> and here, various, various campaigns had various types of fundraising. And in London, uh, they rented some boats and were on the Thames ri River with their Palestinian flags. And South Africa, their campaign. In Sweden, their campaign. And even in Gaza. In Gaza, one of the reasons not only to call international attention to the blockade of Gaza, but it's also these flotillas are an opportunity for, uh, for people in Gaza to remind others, to remind kids that even though they're living in a blockaded country, people still care about them. School teachers use the fact that we have these flotillas to, to get the kids going, to say, look, people are really concerned about us. And some of those went out on the beach and made this beautiful, beautiful design for us. And that didn't turn out so well, but <laughs> the, actual, uh, the actual one that they made on the beach was just stunning and kids that are making little boats to, remind, to be a part of this. For months, they were, they were talking about this, and then once we got on underway with the boat, uh, all of a sudden, other things started happening, and we started seeing on Facebook and on, uh, on websites, you know, more things that were happening. 
And we had women that were coming out, a women's uh, uh, international media center. Uh, I don't know who the other nationalities, they call it an international media center in Gaza, but right now few internationals are getting into Gaza. Mostly uh, a few doctors every now and then, but most of the time uh, internationals are not allowed by the state of Israel to even get into Israel to come on, to go through Israel to go to Gaza. So we had a captain and a crew, women captain and crew, and our captain was a a woman by the name of Madeline Habib. Now, how about that one? Mm -hmm. A Habib. Uh, her father was Egyptian, her mother British, and the family moved to Australia. And Madeline is one of the world's most competent captains. She has captained very, very large ships to include the Medicine Sans Frontier, MSF, Doctors Without Borders ship that is in the Mediterranean that is rescuing migrants that are coming up from North Africa. And her stories as we would sit day after day after day and night after night after night, 24 hours a day, we were on the move five miles an hour. So we had a long time to chat and to hear the stories of Madeline as she talked about the numbers of people that they've rescued, rescued in the Mediterranean. And also stories of her being a captain of boats in the, in the Pacific and boats that, including one that she'll be leaving on in just a couple of weeks, that will be going down to Antarctica, a research ship from Australia and France. So she was a very, very competent uh, captain that we had extreme confidence in, and we needed it because we had all sorts of challenges. Here's our little crew. Um, uh, only three of the women, or only two of the women, women were actually crew on that boat, but the other three were part of uh, the other boats as we attempted to sail them and sometimes they didn't go. So we had the, the um, women that actually went were from uh, Norway and Sweden. And here's a, in Barcelona, our very first place where we got all of the first round of guests. We had uh, 39 women that were supposed to go on the various lakes, 13, 13, and 13. Or actually it was gonna be 26. 13 on one boat, 13 on another boat. So 26 at a time times three, 78. Uh, plus uh, people who'd come in from all over the world to be part of the ground team, the welcoming team, the people that were helping buy things and helping with our logistics. So it was a pretty big operation and people were flying at their own expense. The campaign did not pay for any people to go on this. Everyone had to do their own fundraising for their transportation and for their hotels. Um, we, all of the money that was raised went directly into the boats and outfitting the boats. And here are some of the women that were a part of that first. Um, Judith, who is an Israeli uh, journalist who now is under siege by the government of Israel for her going on this mission. Uh, Lisa Fithian, who's from uh, Austin, Texas, who was our nonviolence trainer. Uh, Dr. Fazia Hassan, who is from Malaysia. She was our doctor on the whole journey. Uh, Gail Miller, who is one of our uh, steering committee members in the United States. Uh, Ellen Hassan, who, pardon me, Ellen Hansen from uh, Sweden. And then that's me right there. And in Barcelona, we had three days of events, fundraising events for the Spanish campaign. Uh, wonderful events where thousands of people were coming down to the, the waterfront in uh, Barcelona to uh, be with us and to wish us well. Here's some of the folks. That, uh, this young lady, uh, Laura from the Spanish campaign, had been on the Marvy Marmara six years ago in 2010 and was one of the people that got some of the, the only photographs of the carnage of that trip. And she's one of the great campaigners in Spain. And here's some of the, uh, the stage work that was done where we, every night, we had events that, uh, to introduce all of the women that would be going on the trip to the people of Barcelona who were being so gracious about hosting us. And I did my little speech, and here's more as we're getting ready to, to go. Um, beautiful artwork that was done. This lovely uh, painting was painted over a period of a couple of days. And we were getting ready to sail on the first night. And as you can see, storm clouds brewing. 
Well, we had, we had trouble not only getting one of the boats out, as I mentioned, the engine on the Amal, on the Hope. After endless weeks of getting this boat ready, of all sorts of people from all over the world working on the boat to get various aspects of it, and the engine, the internal side, in the infirm parts of the engine that nobody could get into unless they took the whole motor apart. And even though we had been promised by the guy that sold us the boat. How many of you all, oh, this is me, probably all of you have owned boats. <laughs> well, you know what, sometimes it happens. And that's what happened to us. Our sweet little boat did not uh, get outside of Barcelona. It's now for sale in Barcelona. If you know anyone who wants to buy a boat without an engine. And here we are on the very last night before we were getting ready to sail. Uh, the the uh, Olivia Zaituna was the one boat that moved on. And we moved on from Barcelona to Ajaccio, uh, uh, Corsica, it, uh, France, as I mentioned. Uh, on board we had, um, let's see, uh, uh, a parliamentarian from uh, Chile, a lady from Spain who is very prominent in their political system but not a parliamentarian and a European Parliament member from Sweden on that first leg, among others. Um, that's me. Do I look a little bedraggled? <laughs> well, it was because virtually the whole trip, the whole three days was stormy weather. You saw those first clouds? Well, let me tell you. It stormed the whole time. And by the time we got to Ajaccio, Corsica, at two in the morning, three days later, after everybody but our captain and one of our crew members had been sick virtually the whole way. <laughs> virtually the whole way. And let me tell you what seasickness is as a great equalizer among <laughs> all sorts of people and from all nations. It was like that formed us a team, a really strong team, because everybody was helping everyone else. Our little Ziploc bags, which were the seasick bags, that we, we ran out of, and we had to start rewashing them because we didn't have enough. And Dr. Fazia, our doctor from Malaysia, as she was giving people more patches for their ears, giving them more pills for their seasickness, and more bags, and more bags, and finally one of the ladies was, I mean, she just was nonstop, just whatever. And finally the doctor said, well, I have jabs. It was like, jabs? What are jabs? I mean, Malaysian term for what? She said, injections, shots, shots. And we can give shots to people, and maybe that'll calm their stomachs down. So all of a sudden, I mean, I, we don't have pictures of this, but <laughs> if you can just imagine three women's behinds, like on a table, as, as the doctor holding her own bag, because she was seasick too. <laughs> And she had the jabs going bump, 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 you know. And, oh. So seat sickness was something that plagued us on every, every leg of this. Every leg we were blessed with very stormy weather. And through it all, people just hung in there, just kept going. Here in Ajaccio, we had uh, uh, Lisa Gay um, Hamilton, an actor from the United States, was a part of our, she's in, has been in uh, TV shows such as The Practice, uh, Dr. Fazia again, and Norsham, another woman from uh, Malaysia, um, who was, all, was one of our sickest seasick sea people. One of the ladies on the first trip, we, when we got into Corsica, we had to call an ambulance to have them come down and get one of the ladies from Spain to go directly to the hospital because she was so dehydrated. Uh, Lisa Gay Hamilton over on the right talking with uh, the wife of one of the great Palestinian supporters who's been a part of the Russell Tribunal. Uh, Hessel is his last name, but she's 87 years old and came down to be a part to welcome us. We had luminaries on board, luminaries from the media world. This woman, uh, um, Khadija ben, ben Gwema, is from Algeria, and she is one of the most famous of all the Al Jazeera um, commentators. Um, she, as you can see, she's just a beautiful woman, and when she arrived on the docks of uh, Ajaccio, uh, Corsica, to, to go on the trip all the way down to Messina, 
uh, she looked pretty much like this. <laughs> and she had a suitcase that was about that big and, and some very high heels. And she came down on the dock and we all went, whoa, what's going on here? <laughs> and uh, and we'd, been, we'd been told, you know, she's very famous in the, in the Arab world. And we were very honored to get her on board uh, along with another Al Jazeera person. They were going to be doing live satellite broadcasts and all of this. And we were thinking, we don't have room for that suitcase. I mean, we're going to have to drag it behind the boat. There's just no room. And so we told the people who had actually arranged for her to, to be with us that maybe they should go back up to the hotel and maybe they could find some little bag she could put some of her stuff in and maybe those high <laughs> heels, maybe they should be left behind. Well, when she arrived the next morning, she, she had definitely gotten the message. She wasn't about to fall off that boat because she was wearing high heels or whatever. Uh, and she also, um, three days into this, said, if anyone dares post a picture of me, after she too had been just sicker than a dog on this boat. <laughs> uh, here's some more of the women that were on it, um, on the boat uh, down to um, um, Sicily. Uh, Hyatt is uh, an Egyptian who is also uh, from Al Jazeera. She is part of what's called Al Jazeera Online, and she was doing interviews with everyone and then uploading them by satellite so that we had a, a wonderful array of interviews from the women that were on this boat. Uh, Fatima is from, uh, she's a member of parliament from Tunisia, and then Dr. Fazia again from Malaysia. And this is uh, also one of the events that were held by the people in Ajaccio, uh, Corsica. Every place we went, we really had a wonderful host group that that provided lots of um, educational materials for the local people and a, a warm welcome and farewell for us. And then we got to Messina, Sicily. And as you can see, we are in a very prominent place. I mean, look at this. This is the town hall of Messina, Italy. And we were being hosted by the mayor of Messina, a wonderful guy with whom we had been with earlier in the springtime when we had our first international coalition meeting and we had it in Messina. Um, he was a gracious host and said, we will make sure that the city turns out when, if you all get that boat down here, we will make sure that you're treated well. And he was good to his word. And these are uh, many of the women who came in on the boat to Messina and then were going to leave on the boat going out. Nobel Peace Laureate Marie McGuire, uh, Marama Davidson, a member of parliament from New Zealand, Naomi Wallace, uh, Naomi Wallace from the United States, a playwright who does plays about Palestine. Unfortunately, she, was, she did not get on the last boat because we, we needed to have people from 13 nations on it, and I bumped her off. I became the boat leader, and so I took the U.S. slot. And unfortunately, dear Naomi, a wonderful woman who will continue to write lots and lots about this, uh, was not able to be on it. Okay, and here's some more pictures of many of the women that were there. Uh, again, the mayor of Messina, and then the, this is the Palestinian uh, ambassador to Italy who came to Rome to meet us. And more photos of various of the women. And then this was the day that we were actually leaving Messina to head for nine days on the ocean, a thousand miles later, to be off the coast of, of Gaza. Um, we have Samira, who is a member of parliament from Algeria, Maureen McGuire, Nobel Peace Laureate from Northern Ireland, Dr. Fazia from uh, Malaysia, uh, the Palestinian ambassador to Italy. She, did, she didn't go on the trip, but she was there to say farewell. Uh, Leanne, who's an Olympic uh, athlete from uh, South Africa and a human rights campaigner, particularly for, human, uh, for university students. And in South Africa right now, many of the universities have closed down because students are protesting an ever-increasing tuition in South Africa. And the South African university administrations, rather than working with the students, are just closing down the universities. Uh, Marama Davidson, a member of parliament from New Zealand, 
uh, Jeanette from uh, Sweden, and uh, Sandra from Spain. And then our other three crew members that aren't in this one. Another photograph, another photograph. And then many of the other people that were there as our support uh, team and people from uh, Messina that were there to help with the uh, ground arrangements. Uh, a Palestinian woman named Renee, who was one of the coordinators uh, for our visit. A wonderful, wonderful lady that, on behalf of the Palestinian community, was really appreciative of what the international team was doing. Uh, this is Signam Tokalu, who is from Turkey. Her husband was one of the nine people murdered on the Marvi Marmara in 2010. And she came to be with us in, uh, uh, in Messina to see us off on that journey. She actually wanted to go on the journey, but between her, you know, having seen what the Israelis are capable of doing, um, we asked that she not push us to, be on, to have her on the boat because she really was not in an emotional state to, uh, to do that, even though she wanted to go. But um, we thanked her so much for coming all the way down to Messina. I'll just keep going on this. And this is a picture of the, uh, generally what the seas look like at the very end of each one of the voyages. Not in the beginning, <laughs> but we did have some very nice days on the Mediterranean as we made the long nine day trip on down to, um, uh, to the coast off Gaza. Uh, here are some of the singers that we had, our two crew members and um, uh, uh, Marama Davidson. And I'll play you at the end of this, I'll play you a song that they wrote for the women of Palestine. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. And again, seasickness. This is Leanne from South Africa looking up at the skies like, please don't do this again to us. <laughs> and some of the pictures of the things. We did have a little trouble on the way. Um, one of the shrouds that hold the mask up uh, popped in the middle of the night. It didn't uh, mean that the mask broke as such, but uh, it was slinging around so much that the captain said this could be I mean, it's a dangerous situation. We need to have this fixed. And so we were approaching Crete as this happened. And we, we uh, uh, did a satellite call to Greek friends that we have that have helped us on, that have been a part of other flotillas. And they knew exactly who to contact in Crete. And all of, we had a meeting point, uh, and all of a sudden a little tiny boat started coming out from the southern shore of Crete. And, as it got pr closer and closer and closer, it looked like, my God, that boat's going to sink. It had like 30 people on it, all of them with Palestinian flags and Palestinian this and that. Everybody that was a Palestinian supporter wanted to get on that boat to come on out to see the women's boat to Gaza. And they brought with them uh, some of the best riggers uh, that they had, uh, guys that could go up in the mast area while the boat was underway and help us fix this thing. So the Greeks, our dear friends, the Greeks, they brought us all sorts of stuff. They brought us wonderful vegetables and foods and uh, some wonderful Greek pastries. And then they bought us, brought us a bottle that, had, that was liquid. And when, when Marmara, the, the New Zealand member of parliament, took a drink out of the water bottle and all of a sudden <laughs> she spewed that out so fast. What is this stuff? Oh. Well, it turned out it was wonderful Greek ouzo <laughs> that looked, looked like water, but it sure wasn't. But since our boat did not have alcohol on it, we had to have an offering to the sea. Yeah, it broke my heart because I love ouzo. <laughs> and here's some of the agreements that we had that, you know, it, when you're taking people on what can be very dangerous missions, and we'd seen it in 2010 that people had been killed by the Israeli military for doing exactly what we had. And even though we were a group of women and were, had done a lot of media work, so the Israelis knew exactly who was on board, all they had to do was follow our website. And I, they were. And they were following our Facebook. They knew exactly who was on board. But you never can tell whenever you have young men and women with weapons. And having been in the military myself 29 years and being around a lot of young people, no matter what the orders are they're given, you never know what might happen. 
And so we were briefing, we were telling our participants that you know, we need to make sure we know what we're doing and we need to, to come to an agreement on what our approach is going to be to the Israeli military. Uh, I mentioned that Lisa Fithian from Austin, Texas had come all the way to Messina to be the nonviolence trainer. And she did a really good job of it, as she had done in 2011 when we trained the people that were on the audacity of hope. We had a reenactment of something that could happen, like if you set everybody down in the, in the floor here and say, okay, what if somebody is coming to, um, uh, to get you to stop doing whatever it is you're doing? What are some of the things, techniques that you use? Well, one of the techniques that we see all of the time is that people lock arms. You know, you're sitting down, you lock arms. That makes it more difficult, you know, to pull us apart. Well, Lisa had arranged for some of the guys of our group to come bursting in the door, bursting in. They were yelling and screaming, just like what happened to us in 2010 on these boats that the Israelis just jumped and attacked all of them. And the guys were pulling everybody's arms apart, and people were seeing how you can get hurt. Your arms can get pulled out. You can, lots of things happen when you start pulling around on people. And one of the women really had a breakdown. This, all of this noise, all of this yelling, the intensity of it. And, and people said, you know, we don't really want that to happen on our boat. We don't, that's not what we came for, to see that sort of reaction of ourselves that may trigger a reaction. Um, so we made an agreement that we were not going to be confrontational with the, uh, with the IDF, the Israeli military, when they came. We knew that they had orders to stop us, um, but how they stopped us might depend on what our actions were. And we have had instances when previous boats have their, some of their passengers link arms around the wheelhouse for the, for the captain to protect the captain, to uh, make it uh, take longer for the IDF to get control of the ship. Well, we didn't have a wheelhouse. As you saw in there, we just had a big wheel. <laughs> it was not like we had anything to protect. And our decision as women were that we did not want to be confrontational. And so we made agreements that we were, uh, uh, we would have one spokesman, and on the political side of it, that would be me as the boat leader. Um, we followed the directions of the captain as far as the safety and security, actually, of the boat. Um, we wanted to make sure as, uh, let's see, peaceful language, uh, positive eye contact with the men and women. We assumed they would have some women that would be coming on board. Uh, that we would all dress to make sure that we had plenty of warm clothes on because in previous times we had not been allowed to go down to have any, you, you were what you, you had on for the next 10 hours after you were stopped by the Israelis, uh, that we needed to make sure everybody had their medicines with them in a, in a place where we could tell the idea if that person needs medicines at a certain point, uh, that we would have uh, our hands open, that we would be uh, so that the IDF could see that we didn't have any weapons. I mean, they knew that we had at least put out the word we were, uh, we would, well, none of our boats have ever had weapons on them. But this being a sign that we are, we're not confrontational on this. Uh, and another thing that we were uh, to remind people to breathe, because at, having been on many of these missions myself, in a way I kind of forget that not everybody's done this and that there are going to be people that are going to be very, very, very nervous and upset. And in fact, every day as we would talk on our boat before uh, we, we actually had the, 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 the Israeli military came on board, every time we would talk about this, it, somebody in our group of 11 passengers, two journalists, somebody would, would not be able to cope with it that something would be triggered in them about the, the danger of this all. So it was really important that we went over it day after day after day so that on that ninth day when the IDF started approaching, oops, I'll just show a few more pictures of the inside of the boat. I forgot to mention this boat that had 13 people on it was built for, or built for eight. 
So we had to uh, become very close friends on there. That indeed the four cabins that we had had a minimum of three people and one, one cabin had four people in it, which meant that two people at a time could, could sleep in the kind of double bed and the third person had to go find some place to hang out which was generally up in the cockpit with a crew. And in fact, we had kind of a rotational schedule to make sure that we had people that were with the crew all the time to keep them awake and if they needed anything. Uh, we also needed to have people that were, um, uh, well, let's see, cooking. Uh, this is actually uh, 80 miles to go to Gaza when we finally were getting close and within the range that we figured that the IDF would probably approaches anywhere from 100 miles in to shore. So at 80 miles, we all started getting ready. We all had our shirts on, we packed our bags, we had our um, um, p passports, and you can see that we, we told everybody to start wearing these little, have their documents on them so that we would not at the last minute be floundering around with what we needed. Uh, we boiled 60 hard boiled eggs to have to eat during this period. We didn't know where we would, uh, where would we uh, find the, or the IDF would find us, but we wanted to make sure that we had something that was edible um, that we could get to. And we had a little contest as always. Who can peel the, the egg the best? <laughs> Let me tell you, that's my hand right over there. And the United States did not win that contest. <laughs> We had, this is Dr. Fazio with a satellite phone. For the last three days we were on, we had nonstop media attention. We had people calling in from all over the world on radio and newspapers and bloggers talking to all the women that were on the boat about their perceptions. And you can see Marie McGuire, Nobel Peace Laureate, taking a little snooze right there that we all needed to do at various times. And this is Marmara from New Zealand Member of Parliament doing the dishes as we all took our turns doing them and Dr. Fazia and then Mina uh, over on the left was an, another Al Jazeera journalist. We, were, we had four Al Jazeera journalists on the various legs so the Middle East really got a lot of uh, coverage and you too can see it um, if you go online uh, from the, the Arabic since we no longer have Al Jazeera English in the United States. Uh, Leanne, our Olympic uh, volleyball person, became one of our communications specialists and helping get all of the interviews online. And then again, singing that, oh, that I'm, in. and Sine from Norway, getting ready to put up flags. And there's Marmara again looking out as we actually left uh, Messina. And uh, afternoon chats every day. We really got to know each other pretty well over those nine days. And well, I think we'll all be lifelong friends. It was pretty hot on this voyage. And beautiful sunsets. Beautiful sunsets. We also took with us uh, a photograph of Hetty Epstein, a wonderful lady who died, 92 years old, who died just this year. Uh, she uh, was a Holocaust survivor. She, her family was all killed in the Holocaust, and at five years old, she was sent on the, the kinder transport, the kinder lift, to get um, as many young um, Jewish kids out of Germany so they wouldn't be killed. So she was sent to England. And she's been a lifelong supporter of the Palestinian movement and attempted four different times to go to Gaza on the boats and never made it. So we brought her along. Dear Hetty. <laughs> And here's Al Jazeera Mina and Huda doing some of the broadcasts live. Broadcast live from the women's boat to Gaza. And more chats in the dining room. And the navigational tools that we needed to get us where we were going to now, as we knew that we were getting in the range of the IDF, putting up our flags and banners, and then seeing the IDF approach. Here's one of their large ships. There were three large ships that were way on the horizon. We first heard them on the radio. Zaituna, Zaituna, this is the Israeli military. We order you to stop. We order you to stop. You cannot continue. You are approaching a security zone. And our Captain Madeline saying, Israeli military, Israeli military, this is the Zaituna. 
We are on a mission to Gaza. We are proceeding to Gaza. We do not recognize your illegal security zone and blockade of Gaza. We are proceeding to Gaza. Zaituna, Zaituna. This is the, so this went on for like 20 minutes. And very respectful though, on both sides, both professional captains. Zaituna, Zaituna. We are sending people to stop your boat. Stop your boat. Israeli military, this is the Zaituna. We are not stopping our boat. And so here came actually three of the Zodiacs. And as you can see, there were a lot of people on each one of them, about 25 people on each one. And as this is the only picture that we have of them because we, uh, most everybody had, did not take cameras and cell phones because they, in times past, they've all been taken and never returned. Uh, however, uh, one of the women did have a camera and she took this picture and then took the memory card out and hid it. Most of the time, even if you hide it, they find it. This time they didn't, and this is the one picture we have of the approaching um, military. Uh, another scene of it, another. When these, when these two boats got up next to us, having seen boats like this approach before, I was stunned. It was 25 people on board and none of them had combat equipment on. They didn't have combat helmets on, they didn't have flat vests, they didn't have visible weapons. It's like, what's going on here? They had baseball caps on, they had long jerseys, they had light vests and GoPro cameras. I was like, whoa, maybe they finally have figured out that, that they don't need to kill everybody that tries to challenge their policies, and in fact, maybe they have analyzed who we are and what threat we pose to them, which is no physical threat at all. And so the first people to come on board were eight women, eight women sailors from the IDF, one of whom took control of our boat from our woman captain. All of the young women were very respectful. They said, we need to make sure that we secure all of your identification. If you have any electronics, we need to have them right now. We will be having another team that will be coming on board to check to make sure we got all of the electronics. Well, they didn't get many electronics because we had made an international coalition decision that upon the approach of the IDF, yeah, we would take all of the purchased uh, uh, electronics that we needed to sail all the way down there. Uh, the navigational aids that are now come on iPads, uh, the computers that we needed in order to uh, work satellites, and the satellite phones. All of those we would throw overboard. It broke my heart on one level, because that's a lot of money. A lot of money just thrown over the side, but it was our way to ensure that uh, the IDF did not uh, physically uh, get materials that they could run back and forth and figure out who we'd been talking to and all that. I mean, on one level, we, we know that because of the satellite, uh, the ability for surveillance and wiretapping, eavesdropping, all of this stuff, uh, I mean, they know everything. And if the Israelis didn't know it, the US did, and they were gonna give it to the Israelis anyway. But it was our symbol. We are throwing this stuff overboard, and we did. With the exception of this one, one thing. So at four in the afternoon, we were heading, uh, we'd been, the control of our boat had been taken by the Israelis. We complained bitterly that we were being hijacked, that it was piracy in international waters, 35 mile, 34 miles off the coast of Gaza, that we were being taken against our will to Israel. We didn't want to go there, and they were stealing our boat. So we let them know that. On the way, the eight hours it took from four in the afternoon to midnight to get to the Israeli coast, to the port of Ashdod, uh, we passed the natural gas fields that are off Gaza, oh. off Gaza, yeah. Yeah, there's a reason they want a security zone, uh, and it's the, the gas fields off Gaza. And here's, a, here's one of the uh, photographs of it. This one actually, they've got it up here in, off Israel, but there is the other one that's right down here that they don't put on that map. 
that is a gas field for Gaza, that everybody believes there's slant drilling that's going on that way, and the, the natural gas that should belong to the people of Gaza is not there. And you can actually see right in here these little red dots uh, have already been identified by one of the oil companies or gas companies that have gotten leases on all of this, that all of the things that are in Gaza uh, that should belong to the, people, the Palestinians are not now available to them. As we were approaching the coastline, it was very, very stark. I mean, it was amazing to, to be going straight into the coastline and to the north, to the left, to see nothing but lights, a string of lights. These lights, whoops, wait a minute. These lights that you see right up there, that whole coastline lights the industrialized state of Israel. And then to the right, starting right in here, nothing but darkness, and that's Gaza. Nothing but darkness, because the Israelis control all of the electricity that goes in there. Usually four hours of electricity a day is all that they're getting. So kids trying to study, people trying to keep medical equipment going, all of this is extremely difficult for them. This is a satellite image, and it's not very good when you see it on this screen, but it, it showed, this is Israel, and they purposely have put in here, what is Gaza? I mean, it's so dark, so dark. So that, that was the, I mean, that was a really telling moment for us all, the darkness that the world is keeping Gaza in. And the need for us as internationals to support things that will bring the light to show what's going on. This is a, a fuzzy picture, but this, is, this was taken from the docks as our boat to Zaytuna was being brought into Ashdod Harbor at midnight on the night of, the, of uh, October 5th. Uh, we were imprisoned. Uh, we first were interrogated at Ashdod Harbor. Uh, we were charged with entering Israel illegally. We were saying, now wait a minute, you guys kidnapped us. We didn't want to be here. Uh, we were imprisoned at a place called Givon Prison. We were visited, by, we had already made arrangement with some Israeli lawyers, sympathetic Israeli lawyers, uh, to be our legal representatives. And we had already notified all of our embassies that we were on, we were on this mission. And so they knew that we would be, they, they knew, knew we, we were going to be arrested. Uh, we, were, uh, we saw uh, our lawyers and our embassy representatives in the, ap the next afternoon. Uh, then we were taken before an administrative judge who ordered that we be deported. We were taken to a Ben Gurion airport to the detention facility there. Uh, the, and that's an interesting one. You know, a lot of people are in that facility. There are a lot of people that go to Israel that the Israelis do not let in, the people that are going as tourists. But if you've ever had on your Facebook that you might be sympathetic with Palestinian causes, you might just not get into Israel. And if the plane that you came in on has already left, they'll detain you at the airport detention facility. They have a lot of rooms, a lot of rooms, and the people that you meet in them, and the number of days that they've been waiting to, to go home, uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, Marie McGuire, who's been detained or she's actually been deported now four times. She has 40 years of deportation on her record. Marie McGuire, Nobel Peace Laureate, as we were taken into the detention facility and put in rooms that have six bunk beds, or six sets of bunk beds, 12 people in them, all of a sudden Marie started going, I was going, Marie, what are you doing? And she was looking up under the beds and was like, what is happening? She said, well, get up under these beds and look for yourself. And, Oh yeah, here's something that somebody wrote, and I looked under the bed where I was, and it was, it was really odd. It was Marie McGuire, at, or Nobel Peace Laureate Marie McGuire, and U.S. Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney were here in 2009, free Gaza. So on, I don't know why the Israelis have not painted over all of that, because it's, it's wonderful, wonderful history of the people that have been in there. So with whatever we had, we started scraping our little initials in. Well, later on that day, or that evening, at, at 1 o'clock actually the next morning, was when I was finally put on an El Al flight uh, from Ben Gurion Airport to JFK. 
Needless to say, I did not wear this t-shirt on board the Al Al flight because a lot of people on that were not sympathetic with what we'd done. So this is a picture of the Givon prison. And what happened in Gaza? As we were being deported, people were still out on the docks of Gaza saying, we thank you for what you've done. Thank you on behalf of the people of Gaza. And as we returned to our homes and Leanne uh, uh, being met in South Africa and Mina from Al Jazeera going back into London. And I was met in JFK by some of my old buddies, uh, uh, Gail Miller on the right and Ann Shirazi on the left and Lori Arbeiters taking the picture um, uh, with the signs of why we are doing all of this. That we, we want uh, human rights for the Palestinians, respect for the Palestinians. So that's kind of the story of what we're doing. Now, how about next year? Uh, are we going to go again? Well, we will go until the blockade is ended. We will keep going and we will keep going. So I, although I don't know the specific date on it, on the little flyers that we've handed out are some websites that right now reference Women's Vote to Gaza. But these same websites will just change the names of them as we have the next uh, Gaza Freedom Flotilla, and we'll be letting you know. But it will probably be in October, or pardon me, in September, October of next year, and I will be contacting you all. Again, I will originally point a contact for Maine. No, we, we, we will let you all know so that you too can have an opportunity to support this. Uh, Nonviolence International out of Washington, D.C., uh, a great organization that is willing to help groups that are challenging the Israeli policies on Gaza. And let me tell you, with the policies of the United States for the total support of whatever Israel does, any organization in the U.S. that stands up to say, we will help you as a 501c3 receive your funds and take the hit on any legal things that come up. So it's uh, Nonviolence International that's helped us with that. So with that, i uh, stop and then ask you all for questions or comments or whatever. And thank you very much. We steer our cores across the waves We are 13 women here to sail with peace in our hand Towards our sisters in this foreign land To and from many different corners of this world We have come to bring to you the freedom of a song We will sail for Sisters in Palestine, we will never be silent until you are free. We are guided by the lights of the stars. The power of the sea so very bright As the world is watching us We bring our women's voice With a message that we all should have a choice Your grandmothers, they planted olive trees Upon the land where you should live in peace Those trees of thousand years, they have been dark away. May daughters plant new seeds and to let them stay. We will say for your freedom, our sisters in Palestine. We will never be silent until you Until you